All right, my disclosures haven't changed. Um, okay, first question. A 59-year-old woman is referred to you for resistant hypertension. Uh, she was first told she had hypertension about three years ago by her primary care doctor, and she's had gradual intensification of her regimen, but without uh, control of her blood pressure. So currently she's treated with amlodipine, chlorothaladone, and lisinopril, and her blood pressure, according to measurements taken in the primary care uh, doctor's office, have ranged from 150 to 170 over 80 to 100. She does not take her blood pressure at home, and her only complaint is that occasionally she's lightheaded when she stands up. This is, she has osteoarthritis, um, and she has borderline diabetes, and in your office with a manual cuff, you get a blood pressure of 165 over 90, heart rate 61, otherwise her exam is unremarkable. So what's the most appropriate next step? Initiate spironolactone, convert her hydrochlorothiazide to chlorothaladone. Sorry, she's already on chlorothaladone. That's a typo on my part, sorry about that. Order a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure or convert her lisinopril to metoprolol. Okay, I heard C. All right, so resistant hypertension is defined this way. Blood pressure that's above goal um, using, uh, despite three uh, antihypertensive medications, one of them should be a diuretic. All three medications should be at 50% or more of the, recommend, the maximum recommended antihypertensive dose. And so, consequently, if your patient is controlled but requires four medications to be controlled, they also have resistant hypertension. So these are data from NHANES looking at the proportion of hypertensive patients who are controlled or uncontrolled, but really focus over on the right, and specifically the orange bar is compared with the yellow bar. So these are people who are treated and who are considered resistant by the definitions that um, I put on the previous slide. So that's 13% of all hypertensive people in the United States, but again, if you just look, these data are from people who are seeking medical therapy versus, and also not seeking medical therapy. If you just take a clinic population, there is a large study suggesting that, there apparent, that about 18% appear to have resistant hypertension. So people who appear to have resistant hypertension are obviously very common and represent a large proportion of people with hypertension. But there's a difference between apparent resistant hypertension and true resistant hypertension. So you're a patient who has resistant hypertension or appears to might not. And the reason is the white coat effect, which you uh, appropriately identified in the question. Uh, they could be non-inherent to their, your lifestyle recommendations. They could be excessively consuming alcohol or have a very high sodium diet. Uh, they may not be taking their antihypertensive medications. They may be taking another drug, which is raising their blood pressure. Or they may not be on adequate therapy. The doses are not high enough or they're not on a diuretic. So the white coat effect is very common and may be more common and more pronounced in patients with resistant hypertension than in patients with hypertension who appear to be controlled in the office. So th these are data from two large cohort studies, and if you focus on the left side, systolic on the top, diastolic on the bottom, if you look at the gray bars, that's the white coat effect, the difference in blood pressure between what you get in the office and what you get on 24-hour monitoring. The white bars are people who have controlled blood pressure in the office, and the gray bars are people who appear to have resistant hypertension in the office. And so what you can see here is that the white coat effect, the difference between out-of-office blood pressure and in-office blood pressure is significantly greater in people with resistant hypertension as opposed to people who have hypertension, but whose hypertension appears to be controlled in the office. And so the prevalence of a white coat effect, meaning the patient appears to be resistant in your office but actually has controlled blood pressure at home on their medication regimen, is about 40% in people with resistant hypertension. So a very significant portion of people who appear to have resistant hypertension in the office actually don't because of white coat effect. The other thing is that, as you know, patients don't take their medications. So this was a study uh, published a few years ago where there were 375 patients who were referred to a hypertension clinic, and, they, and 108 appeared to have resistant hypertension. They took the people who were most, uh, most resistant, so people who had uncontrolled hypertension to, despite four or more medications, and then they excluded people who had an obvious cause of secondary hypertension, and took their urine and sent it for liquid chromatography and mass spec. And 
about half, 52%, about half the patients were not fully adherent with their antihypertensive regimen. And of those 50%, about half of those were taking less than a quarter of the medications that they were being prescribed. So again, medic and there are other studies that have confirmed these results. So again, medication adherence is very common. Um, there are a number of drugs which can uh, produce resistant or produce apparent resistant hypertension. Uh, many of them are prescription drugs, which will be obvious when you look at the record, but some of them we need to make sure that our patients aren't taking over-the-counter decongestants or some herbal supplements or obviously NSAIDs. If your patient is a man and is drinking three or more alcoholic beverages on average during uh, per day, or if they're a woman, more two or more alcoholic beverages per day, that can also produce a, an increase in the blood pressure, and then obviously some illicit drugs. The other thing is that suboptimal therapy is also very common. So this is a cohort of about a half million patients who are being followed for hypertension. And 18% appeared to have resistant hypertension. It, half of them because it were controlled, but on four, and half of those were uncontrolled on three or more. But if you look at, um, if you take away the people who were not getting a diuretic, and you take away the people who were on antihypertensive medications, but the doses were being, were not appropriate doses, they were too low, then really that gets cut in about half. So when you, when you consider it all together, the white coat effect, uh, non-adherence to medications, uh, other drugs that the patient may be taking, raising the blood pressure, and the possibility that the patients are not on the appropriate drugs or at the appropriate doses, the prevalence that we talk about for resistant hypertension of 15%, 18%, 13%, probably quite a bit lower than that. Okay, so the same woman returns after performing her 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure. Mean blood pressure is 151 over 72, so it's confirmed uh, that, that it's high. She feels well, again, same complaint, just occasionally she's lightheaded when she stands up quickly. Her exam is unremarkable. Um, so a review of her prescription and non-prescription medications did not reveal anything that could raise her blood pressure. Uh, she claims that she has no trouble taking her antihypertensive medications, and when you check with the pharmacy, she's filling them on a regular basis. Uh, she claims she doesn't skip doses. Uh, which of the following tests would be appropriate at this time? So A, uh, an aldo-renin ratio. B, electrolyte serum creatinine urinalysis. C, uh, some screening tool such as the stop bang questionnaire for sleep apnea. Uh, D, 24-hour urine metanephrines and norometanephrines. E, a CT of the abdomen to look at the adrenal glands. F, 24-hour urine-free cortisol, or G, A, B, and C. Good. Okay, so this brings up the question of after you've confirmed somebody has resistant hypertension. So you've ruled out the white coat effect, uh, you've ruled, you know, they're not taking any drugs that can affect, um, can raise the blood pressure, they're not drinking excessive amounts of alcohol, uh, and you, you believe your patient has true resistant hypertension. What, what forms of secondary hypertension should you evaluate for? And so the answer to that is to look for common forms of secondary hypertension, such as primary aldosteronism, uh, such as obstructive sleep apnea. The other forms of secondary hypertension that are much, much less common, I'm not going to talk about renal artery stenosis because Dr. Grizek already talked about that. Um, other fo forms of uh, secondary hypertension, like FEO, for example, are very, very rare. And so you wouldn't take all resistant hypertensive patients and evaluate them for some rare cause of secondary hypertension unless they had specific signs or symptoms, so they're having spells, or they have a, a, an, an adrenal incidentaloma in conjunction with uh, resistant hypertension. So primary aldosteronism is one of the most common causes of secondary hypertension, and its prevalence depends upon the population you're studying. So if you take a population with resistant hypertension, the prevalence can be as high as 20%. So this is something, and as a result, the Endocrine Society, uh, which just updated their guidelines in 2016 this year, suggests that all patients with resistant hypertension should be screened for primary aldosteronism. And the way that they suggest screening for primary aldosteronism is with the aldo-renin ratio. So if you're going to follow the, I know that the, I don't expect anybody to be able to read this. This is here specifically to make a point. And if you're going to follow the recommendations of the Endocrine Society to the letter of the law, and you're going to do an aldo-renin ratio, this is what you have to, you, you only have to take into consider all of this. 
So over on the left is a table of things that can cause false positive and false negative results. So you have to take all of that into consideration. And then the suggested approach is listed on the right. So this is very simple. Okay, you have to, let's say, walk your patient around for two hours, then have them sit in a chair for 15 minutes, and then you have to measure, take their blood, but you can't take it with a vacutainer. You have to use a needle and a syringe to slowly remove it, right? You have to keep it at room temperature because renin, if you put it, renin on, uh, blood on ice, the renin will be uh, converted. Uh, pre pre uh, pro renin will be converted to active renin, and that'll mess up your result. Not only that, in your resistant hypertensive patient, you have to take them off all the drugs that you want them to be on and for four weeks and do the te this, this blood test this way or take them off those medications, put them on medications you don't want them to be on for four weeks and, and do this test. Okay, so this is, this is quite complex to follow the letter of the law for the aldo-renin ratio. So you do all of that. You go through all that trouble and then you get your aldo-renin ratio back and you look to the endocrine society for guidance on, okay, is the test positive or is the test not positive? And the answer is, you don't know, okay? But they also tell you that if your test is positive, you're not done. You have to go on and you have to do a confirmatory test to make sure they have primary aldosteronism. I hope nobody in the audience is from the endocrine society. <laughs> Um, but they will tell you that it's very denominator dependent. So, right, you're, you're taking the aldo concentration and dividing it by the renin concentrate, the, the plasma renin activity, and the assay for plasma renin activity varies from lab to lab. Most labs are somewhere have a sensitivity from 0.1 to 0.6. Okay, so let's say you had a patient with primary aldosteronism and they had a high uh, blood level of aldo, say 11, and you're using an assay that goes down to 0.6, so you have a ratio of 18. Uh, most people would consider that a negative, but that's a false negative. And then let's say your ta patient's taking a beta blocker which suppresses renin and you're using a very sensitive assay and your PRA is, I mean your aldo is 6, so you have a very high ratio, uh, but that patient doesn't have primary aldosteronism. So the other thing is if you, if you go into the Endocrine Society document with one question and that question is what's a positive ratio, they will not tell you. So different investigators use different things. So if you're going, and, and this is not support, this, what I'm about to tell you is not in conjunction with the Endocrine Society, uh, but it would just be a, a suggestion, okay, and this could be controversial, is that if you have your patient with resistant hypertension that you want to screen for primary aldosteronism, but you don't have any other reasons, such as hypokalemia, to, to have a high clinical suspicion that they have primary aldosteronism, you can do the aldo-renin ratio. Um, there are a variety of studies. One looked at a ratio greater than 30 and a plasma aldosterone greater than 20. That had a 90% sensitivity and specificity. But what UpToDate suggests is a ratio greater than 20 to 30 but also to look not just at the ratio, but the plasma aldosterone concentration. So plasma aldosterone concentration greater than 15. So if you have um, somebody, and, and the, other, the other thing is that you don't have to do with this, you, you can follow endocrine society to the letter of the law, but it's very complicated and it's very difficult. So if you have your resistant hypertensive patient and you want to do an aldo-renin ratio and you want to then use that information to move on to the next step and confirm with a confirmatory test, which we'll talk about later, um, using a ratio of greater than 23, 20 to 30, but also a high aldosterone concentration. Um, should, uh, will take you to the next step. And again, just make sure your patient's not taking spironolactone or a plarinone when you do this test. The other thing is if patients have a high index, if you have a high index of suspicion for primary aldosteronism, it would be reasonable to skip the screening test, save yourself the hassle, and just go right on to the confirmatory test. Okay, so sleep apnea, another common cause of resistant hypertension. There are a variety of ways of screening for sleep apnea. Probably the best screening tool is the stop bang. Uh, questionnaire or tool, and there are a variety of different things to look for when you use the stop bang, such as snoring, daytime fatigue, hypertension. But, but if you have a patient who's morbidly obese, has hypertension, and is over the age of 50, that's three or any three or more of those items being present has a 93% sensitivity for having sleep apnea. The other common one that's used is the Berlin questionnaire, but the sensitivity of that is not quite as high. But how you should also keep in mind that these data are for all comers, right? You can see hypertension is part of the criteria. 
patients with resistant hypertension are much more likely to have sleep apnea than patients without resistant hypertension. And obese patients with resistant hypertension are very likely to have sleep apnea. So these are two studies that got almost identical results looking at obese individuals with resistant hypertension, performing sleep studies, and finding that more than 80% of the patients had uh, an apnea hypopnea index greater than 15. So the reasonable people can disagree about whether we should be looking for sleep apnea in all patients with resistant hypertension, and this is oftentimes cited. So this was a meta-analysis of 29 trials comparing CPAP versus nothing, and three trials of CPAP versus a blood pressure medicine or, or some other device. And there was a very small effect. So it was a significant effect um, of 2.6 uh, millimeters of uh, mercury systolic benefit with, sleep, with CPAP compared to no CPAP. Um, but there was a very large variety, I mean, a very high level of variability, as you can see in the meta-analysis. And also, this was all comers. This isn't patients with resistant hypertension. So the effect of CPAP on resistant hypertension in people with obstructive sleep apnea may actually be greater than it is in people without resistant hypertension. So if you just take the seven randomized trials that were done in resistant hypertension and sleep apnea, there's a more, it seems to be a more important um, effect on blood pressure than in all comers. So this was a, the systolic reduction in this meta-analysis was seven millimeters of mercury and the diastolic was five millimeters of mercury. Okay, next question. You order electrolytes, creatinine, urinalysis, uh, PRA, and, uh, and sorry, the plas what this is meant to say is an aldos PR, um, plasma aldosterone, or PAC. So none of these tests are remarkable, and the suspicion for sleep apnea is low. She's thin. Uh, her questionnaire is negative. She remains on these three drugs. So the question is, which is the next best step? Uh, a, catheter-mediated renal denervation, B, convert chlorothaladone to hydrochlorothiazide, C, initiates bronolactone, or D, convert lisinopril to metoprolol. All right, C. So maybe Dr. Grizek will argue with me because I, I heard him mention catheter-mediated renal denervation at the, at the end. But so the, the, about 10 years ago or so, um, a post hoc analysis of the ASCOT trial was published. And in this trial, there were two combinations that were compared. Doxazacin was added as a third drug to achieve the blood pressure target of 140 over 90 in this trial. But a large number of people needed a fourth drug to control their blood pressure in this trial. And it happened that spironolactone was that fourth drug in about 1,400 individuals. Another drug was used as, used as the fourth agent and everybody else who needed a fourth drug. But what was noted is that the people who, once they were started on spironolactone, had a huge reduction in their blood pressure in this trial. Um, systolic blood pressure difference was, um, you know, uh, cha was changed by 22 millimeters of mercury, was reduced, and, and um, diastolic by 9 millimeters of mercury. So this prompted studies looking at spironolactone as a means of controlling resistant hypertension. And I'm going to talk about two trials. So the first one was a large study of 117 patients with resistant hypertension on average of four medications. They were randomly assigned to spironolactone 25 a day or placebo and followed with 24-hour ambulatory monitoring. And compared with placebo, spironolactone resulted in a very large difference in 24-hour blood pressure, 14 millimeters of mercury systolic. Probably the best trial was the Pathway 2 trial. So again, large study, 285 patients with resistant hypertension despite um, the optimal three-drug regimen. So these patients were already on an ACE inhibitor, a calcium channel blocker, and a diuretic. And they were then assigned to one of four therapies, placebo, spironolactone, a beta blocker, and alpha blocker. And they were followed for 12 weeks on each, on each therapy. And spironolactone had the greatest effect. So there was a 14 millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure with spironolactone, a uh, six millimeter reduction in diastolic blood pressure, and the reduction with the other antihypertensive medications was not as substantial. So renal denervation has come up. And there are papers about renal denervation that are being published all the time. Um, so this was uh, the original Simplicity Hypertension 2 trial published six years ago in The Lancet showing that renal denervation had a huge effect on blood pressure in people with uh, resistant hypertension. This was an unblinded trial of before and after. Um, the Simplicity Hypertension 3 trial, which you're familiar with by now, came out two years ago. 
And this was 535 patients with resistant hypertension on average of five antihypertensive medications. And what's unique about this study, it's actually not unique anymore because there was another, although smaller trial, looking at renal denervation versus sham, which was null. Um, this, uh, they used uh, renal denervation using the simplicity catheter in half, and the other half had an intervention but actually didn't have the renal denervation. They were followed for six months, and there was no benefit on clinic blood pressure, no benefit on 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure, and six patients had an adverse event in, the, uh, in getting the intervention, or 1%. Um, so one of the, one of the um, complaints about this trial is that, you know, it was a multi-center study, and the complaint is that some of the patients who were, I mean, some of the operators who were doing the renal denervation weren't experienced, and they were sort of learning as they were going. And that the results would have been better had it been in the hands of people who knew how to do it uh, and had, who did it all the time. So one of the follow-ups was um, the Diener hypertension trial, or the Diener HTN trial, which was published last year in The Lancet, and there were 106 patients here with confirmed resistant hypertension despite optimal therapy, and they were placed on a, sort of a standardized intensification of their regimen or to catheter-based renal denervation by an experienced, uh, by experienced uh, operators. Uh, but this was an unblinded trial, so there was no sham intervention. They were followed with 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure um, over six months. And so this was a positive trial. The re main results are up at the top. So blue is denervation, red is no denervation, and the decline in blood pressure was 16 millimeters of mercury with renal denervation and nine millimeters of mercury with intensification of the antihypertensive regimen. There was no difference in how many drugs the patients needed at the end of six months. But this trial, was, has a potential risk of bias for several reasons. First of all, uh, there was no sham procedure, uh, so you can't rule out the placebo effect of having an intervention done. Um, there were a number of patients in this trial who were lost to follow-up, and they were all in the denervation group, and so they were not analyzed. And um, th Having a high rate of loss to follow-up is another thing that can bias a trial. People who, have a, who, l who are lost to follow-up compared to people who are not lost to follow-up in trials tend to be sicker than the people who are not lost to follow-up, tend to have worse outcomes. Um, Baseline blood pressure was higher in the denervation group, so you start out with a higher blood pressure. If you look at the, at the very end right here, does this work? These blood pressures are not different from each other. These blood pressures are different from each other. So this, in statistics, is called regression to the mean, so, and, and is a potential knock on this study. There's also another trial which was just published. This is hot off the press in Journal of Hypertension. Uh, it has a similar name, but it's slightly different. It was a small study, so obviously this, this will probably be repeated at, on a larger scale. But this is the, the, the only trial that's, com whoop, that's comparing spironolactone with renal denervation. Again, unblinded. So 27 patients, half got spironolactone at 50 milligrams, half got catheter-based renal denervation using the Simplicity catheter, followed for uh, six months with ambulatory blood pressure, and the spironolactone resulted in a greater drop in blood pressure compared with uh, renal denervation. So the answer there was um, spironolactone. So again, going back to this, uh, this is a rehash of the first uh, talk. ACE inhibitor or long-acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker is step one. Um, the combination is step two, adding a thiazide-like diuretic such as chlorothaladone or endapamide, step three, and in patients with resistant hypertension, uh, either spironolactone or a plerinone. Okay, question four. 37-year-old woman is referred to you for resistant hypertension. She's got headaches, fatigue, and she's got muscle cramps. Her blood pressure is 170 over 100. She takes it at home. She gets the same thing. BMI is she's a little overweight. Exam is otherwise unremarkable. She's on enalapril at a high dose. She's on hydrochlorothiazide, triamterine, and a tenolol, and her potassium is 2.6. Her other labs are normal. Uh, so which of the following would most likely establish in italics and all bold and all caps, establish the correct diagnosis. So a fractionated plasma metanephrines, renal angiogram, the aldo-renin ratio, uh, low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, or 24-hour urine aldosterone after oral sodium loading. Okay, so the answer here is gonna be E. So 
Patients with resistant hypertension uh, possibly have primary aldosteronism. The Endocrine Society says do the aldo renin ratio first, but um, that's oftentimes problematic and impractical uh, for all of the reasons that we already discussed. So if this patient has hypokalemia, so if you have a high index of suspicion that your patient with resistant hypertension has primary aldosteronism, I would suggest skipping the aldo renin ratio and all of the issues that come along with the aldo renin ratio and going straight to the confirmatory test. And there are four options for the confirmatory test. The two most commonly used are the outpatient salt suppression test, this, the oral sodium loading. That's three days of a high salt diet with a 24 hour urine collection. Saline infusion test is the other one that can be commonly done. It requires some time in an infusion center. The one that's done at, and, and either are fine, the one that's done at, at our hospital is the outpatient oral sodium loading test. You can do this with either uh, prescribing salt tablets or you can use these. So these things are sitting in the hypertension clinic uh, at the Brigham, um, but it's just as easy to go out and buy them. Um, so these are bouillon packets, and each one has 50 uh, millimoles of sodium. So if you're taking four of these, that's 200 millimoles of sodium in addition to whatever you're consuming with your diet. So if you put it in, if you sprinkle it on your food, if you put it in with whatever you're cooking, you can raise the uh, sodium level up high enough without having to have the patient go to the pharmacy and pick up a prescription of salt tablets. So um, make sure, because this, because blood pressure is going to go up, potassium is going to go down if they have hyperaldosterone, primary aldosteronism. So um, you need to aggressively uh, replete the potassium if it's low. Do your best to control the blood pressure, and then for three days take four packets. So you're raising the the, the sodium intake uh, for three days, and you're you're on the third day you're doing a 24-hour urine, which you then send off for creatinine to make sure it's an adequate collection, aldosterone, and sodium. And the reason you look for sodium is you just want to confirm that you've put your patient on a large amount of sodium, greater than 200 mill equivalents in 24 hours. So if you do that and the aldosterone is more than 12, or 12 to 14 uh, micrograms per 24 hours, you have a patient with primary aldosteronism. Okay, so you intensify her blood pressure medicines, give her potassium supplements, you do the oral sodium loading test. Uh, her 24-hour urine reveals 280 millimoles of sodium and 54 micrograms of aldosterone. So this patient has primary aldosteronism. So what are you going to do now? A, order an adrenal CT, B, send her for adrenal vein sampling, or C, start spironolactone. Okay. So, um, in patients with primary aldosteronism, um, so that she's 37. So some, a lot, mo many experts suggest doing an adrenal CT at this point, uh, particularly in young people, because if you have a microadenoma, and um, which are microadenomas being less common in younger people than in older people, so the presence of a microadenomas in a very young person with primary aldosteronism, some experts would use that as uh, sufficient evidence to go ahead and do an operation and remove the affected adrenal gland, the one that has the microadenoma. Other experts would not. Um, but the, the, one of the main uses for the adrenal CT is just to exclude adrenal carcinoma, which is not common. It's a rare cause of primary aldosteronism, but it has been described. All right, the CT reveals a one centimeter adenoma in the left adrenal gland. So this is a 37-year-old woman. The right adrenal gland appears normal. So what are you gonna do now? A, refer for surgical resection. B, adrenal vein sampling. C, start spironolactone. Or D, ask her if she would like to pursue the possibility that surgery could help with her hypertension. Okay, all different answers. So the point here is that um, Mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. So the downside is that that would be, you know, lifelong therapy potentially in that person. But they do control, they can control the blood pressure in people with, with um, primary aldosteronism and are associated, and, and the risk of cardiovascular events is not known to be any higher if you just treat with spironolactone, for example, versus go in and operate. So this was a study uh, in the Archives of Internal Medicine um, a few years back. 54 patients with primary aldosteronism, uh, 24 received adrenalectomy, and 30 received spironolactone. They were followed for more than seven years. The blood pressures were equivalent. Cardiovascular events were equivalent. So the issue there is that if your patient is not a good surgical candidate, uh, does not want to have surgery, it's and you have primary aldosteronism and you know they don't have a carcinoma, it's okay to uh, 
uh, prescribe spironolactone and manage their blood pressure that way. There's no, it, it's not known to be any worse than doing an operation. But this patient would like to pursue surgery. So now what, you're, what are you going to do? Are you going to have the left adrenal gland removed or are you going to do adrenal vein sampling? Right. So there was a study that published also a few years back. Uh, it was a systematic review, 38 studies, 950 patients with primary aldosteronism that all of them got an adrenal vein sampling, and all of them got either a CT or an MRI. So the question that the investigators asked was, if you were to use the imaging alone to guide your treatment so that you saw a unilateral disease, you went in and you took it out. If you saw no disease or bilateral disease, then you treated with spironolactone and didn't do surgery. So 20% of the time, you would inappropriately exclude people from having a surgical cure or surgical treatment of their hypertension because they, you saw an adenoma on both sides, but really only one was functional. Or you didn't see an adenoma, but there really was one. Um, and if you, you would do an inappropriate adrenalectomy in 20% of patients uh, because even though you saw an adenoma on one side, uh, in 15% of the people, even though the adenoma was only seen on one side, the disease was really bilateral, or 4% of the time, um, you know, you took out the wrong adrenal gland. So the answer here is to do adrenal vein sampling. It, in this patient, it confirmed um, disease on the left. She had a left adrenalectomy, and the blood pressure is now uh, well controlled, although she still requires um, low dose lisinopril. So, going through primary aldosteronism, uh, possible primary aldosteronism, um, the Endocrine Society suggests doing the screening test, but I would suggest that if you have a high index of suspicion, to skip the screening test and go right on to your three day oral sodium loading test or your saline infusion test. Uh, once you've confirmed primary aldosteronism, do the adrenal CT. If there's no cancer, then the next question is well, um, do you want to pursue surgery? If not, treat with uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. If you do want to uh, pursue surgery, adrenal vein sampling. Okay, this should be the last question because I think I don't have very much time left. Um, and then again, I'll go to the back and, and, and take questions. So you refer to 71-year-old woman for resistant hypertension. She has spells, so consisting of headaches, palpitations, and diaphoresis, and tremors. Uh, she has chronic pain. She takes acetaminophen and amitriptyline. Otherwise, she's asymptomatic. Her blood pressure is 180 over 65. Her exam is unremarkable. She takes Erbisartan, amlodipine, and atenolol. Her primary care provider performed a CT scan of the abdomen with contrast, which was normal. Um, and also the PCP performed fractionated uh, plasma metanephrine. So plasma meta nor metanephrine was uh, 1.2, which was a little bit high. And plasma metanephrine was normal. So she's got a high plasma nor metanephrine. She has spells, and she's got a normal abdominal CT. I should also mention here, uh, which I didn't, that she doesn't have a family history of you know, multiple endocrine neoplasia. Um, she doesn't have a familial syndrome. So which one of the following statements is true? A, she probably has pheo. Uh, B, it's common for patients with pheo and symptomatic spells to have normal appearing adrenal glands. C, it's common for patients with pheo with symptomatic spells to have mild elevations of fractionated plasma metanephrines. Um, or D, it's probably a false positive test. So the answer here is D. So just a few uh, take home points about pheochromocytoma. First of all, it's very rare. Um, if you take all comers with hypertension, it's present in about 0.04% of patients. If you take people who present with hypertension and the spells, so this woman had spells, it's about 0.4% of patients will have uh, pheochromocytoma. So this PCP ordered um, plasma-free metanephrines, which have a 99% sensitivity and an 89% specificity um, when they're elevated. But because it's such a rare disease, if you go through the, you remember these uh, four cell sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value tables? So let's say you had 100,000 patients um, with hypertension and 400 had uh, pheo, and 99,600 didn't have pheo, and you do plasma-free metanephrines on everybody. So the plasma-free metanephrines, you'll have, you'll identify four people with pheo, um, <clears throat> sorry, 396 people with pheo will have a positive plasma metanephrine, four will have a negative metanephrine, and then people with, um, no pheo, 
with a positive metanephrine is 10,956. And, and the point of going through this exercise is that the positive predictive value of plasma free metan of a positive plasma free metanephrine in somebody with hypertension is very, very low. So solely based on the plasma free metanephrine, this is likely to be a false positive test. More take home points uh, regarding pheochromocytoma is that they're almost always in the adrenal gland. There are familial syndromes where they have, there are paragangliomas that are found elsewhere, but most of the time they're in the adrenal gland. Um, and they are a radiologic diagnosis. So they have a characteristic appearance by CT. Uh, they're vascular and in, inhomogeneous. Um, they often, they have a very specific response to contrast. They're three centimeters or larger. Usually they're greater than four centimeters. So if you have a patient who presents with hypertension and symptomatic spells and you do an abdominal CT and you cannot see the pheochromocytoma, your patient, and this is a broad generalization, but your patient doesn't have pheochromocytoma, okay? They can have also a pre-biochemical phase. So if your patient has an abdominal CT for some other reason and the radiologist is telling you this patient has a pheochromocytoma, your patient has a pheochromocytoma even though it's not causing hypertension because they can have a pre-biochemical phase. All right, more take home points. So this is, we just talked about this, watch out for false positive tests. So fractionated plasma metanephrines are usually the initial tests. They're very sensitive and specific, although some experts um, prefer the 24-hour urine fractionated metanephrines. Most patients with a positive test do not have pheo. Um, and if you're patient with pheo and symptomatic spell, with symptomatic spells, uh, if, if they do have pheo, the, the results will be very positive, not just a little positive. So usually five times the upper limit of normal. Um, so if they're only a slightly positive, it's likely a false positive. And the other thing to keep in mind is that there are a lot of drugs that can cause false positive tests. Uh, this patient, for example, was on tricyclic antidepressants. Acetaminophen interferes with the assay, so that's another problem. Um, but these other drugs can also um, cause a false positive test. So uh, 